This is Jerry Fry, audio historian of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. The following is the professional history of a PPB member, told by himself in his own fashion on June the 8th of 2015. These interviews are being recorded in order to compile firsthand a living history of the members of our organization and stories of their professional careers. Many of our members began in what is called the Golden Age of Radio and Television, and this is an attempt to preserve as much data as possible for succeeding generations. This recording is not intended for broadcast without first obtaining permission from Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. With me today at the CBS Studio Center in uh, Studio City, California, is Carson Schreiber, a member of the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters Board of Directors and a gentleman who's been in the industry for the two or three years, I think. <laughs> Carson, nice to have you with us today. Great to be here. I want to start way back at the beginning and tell us a little bit about where you were born and yeah. how you were brought up, your yeah. mother uh, and father. Yeah, born in uh, downtown Los Angeles. Oh my gosh, you're a native son. Absolutely, and uh, it, it was 1946, right after the war. My father was uh, working at Lockheed, and of course after the war there was uh, no need to build planes <coughs> anymore. And so he started his own company. But uh, my father in high school and uh, right after that, was working at the first film company to have 24-7 film studios in Los Angeles, the Sealing Polyscope Company. Really? And uh, that's, uh, if you know where the Glendale Freeway ends at Glendale Boulevard, just south of that, about uh, two or three blocks, mm. is where the Sealing Studios were. Mm. And they also had a zoo because many of the pictures were uh, pictures of Africa or whatever, and they had all the animals so they could shoot on location, and, that, and so they had the zoo there, and it was an attraction way before Disneyland was even thought of. So here's one of the first movie studios that has a theme park. Pardon and say. And then it was the first movie studio to do Saturday morning serials, mm -hmm. and it was the first movie studio that made the first two-hour movie, because they were all short movies up until that moment. Mm -hmm. And then came uh, all the other film companies. And uh, Seelig stole, so, <laughs> sold his studio to uh, William Fox, and it started Fox, uh, 20th Century Fox, or his studio as well. Wow. So oh. that's a little brief way back yeah. then. Then my mother worked at uh, Warner Brothers. Oh, she did. So, I'm three years old, and I can remember this because you know, when you were a little kid, you don't really remember much. Mm -hmm. But on my three, third birthday, I got a radio, and it was a Bendix radio, and it had a 45 player. And the player would plug into the radio, and you went way down to the bottom end of the dial where there was no station, and there was the sound from the 45 changer. Right. Were 45s uh, fairly new at that point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was so 46, that'd be like about 49. Before yeah. we moved to the Valley in 49, so this mm -hmm. was before we moved to, uh, to the Valley. Right. And I just, you know, just got into sound and got into the radio. And I remember always listening to KLAC, the big five, you know, it was like the, you know, at night, my parents wouldn't always be listening to the radio in my room, you know, I would somehow get the radio close to my bed and just kind of turn it on, I'd hear Al Jasbo Collins and, oh, uh, and then um, Dick Haynes in the morning, I love Dick Haynes. Actually, I ended up working with Dick Haynes, he was doing our mornings when I was at KLAC. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I knew Dick up in Sacramento. Yeah. Yes, that's K uh, R A K. Yeah. So that just gave me an interest in radio, and then hearing the stories my parents were saying, anything that had to do with not even realizing entertain it was the entertainment industry, but it mm -hmm. just made me feel that that was comfortable, and that's where I what I wanted to do. From that age, huh? Yeah, three, four, five. Yeah, you yeah. moved to the valley in '49, and there wasn't much here. No. As a matter of fact, on Saturdays shopping, there were really no markets. So you went to the dairy to get your dairy products, 
you went to different farms to get eggs at a, you know, some uh, place where, where all the chickens and hens were, and you went to, uh, uh, to get steaks, you went to the, where all the cattle were. I mean, there are no realize that the valley had like four or five big cattle ranches. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, all the moves and uh, also the the uh, unique aroma. Yeah, I was just saying, the aroma <laughs> must have been there. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to work in radio, and I was listening to uh, KFWB, uh, you know, great radio. And uh, how, did, how did you prepare for getting into the radio industry? I just school. Oh, here's another thing. My, I told you my father started, uh, you know, a company, and part of this company was uh, sound. So he had stereos, oh. and then he also had tape recorders. Uh -huh. So it, another birthday gift was a tape recorder. Oh, that was a prize. So, well, I didn't know what chewing a record meant. No. So on um, my little 45 changer with the sound of the 45 coming through the speaker of the radio, I had my microphone that I was talking into, and queuing it up meant I kept talking and talking and talking until the record started <laughs> after I hit the button. Yeah. And so I just made fake tapes, you know, in my little bedroom, yep. being a DJ. And, and I was listening to, like, like I said, Dick Haynes, and then, then um, Jukebox Jury, uh, uh, Peter Potter, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, Joe Yoakum, and just great folks at that time. And, uh, was your tape recorder, did it use paper tape or acetate tape? No, it was a regular, regular tape. Yeah, yeah. Because my first one was paper. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah. No, it was, actually, I still have some of the tapes. I'm almost scared to play them, thinking that <laughs> sure. they're just going to be plastic with all the, the, the oxide wearing off. Yeah. You know? okay. So I'm gonna, if I do play them, I, I fear I'll get one play, so I'll just digitize it on <laughs> one try. Good, good. <laughs> but... Uh, Here's the deal, you know, I really wanted to get into radio, and I like KFWB, I like KMPC, but when KRLA went on the air, I said, that's, I really like that station much better. And I don't know why, maybe they just had younger DJs or whatever they were saying, or what type of top 40 music they were playing. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit more of a cleaner sound than KFWB, and, and then I said, Mom, I want to get a job there. And so I didn't even have a driver's license. My mother drove me to some of the station, you know, personal appearances and stuff, and uh -huh. I met a couple of the DJs. And uh, then as a did, scene... Did you go to any of the uh, network uh, radio shows where they had, had audiences? No, no, I, no. I, I, that was nothing I would always be listening to, but that was almost um, 51, 52, 53. It was almost at the end. I remember hearing those shows, but... Yeah. Unfortunately, it was right at the end. And you know, like NBC had those wonderful studios right where sure. the Chase Bank is now. Yeah. And uh, I never got to go there. They were torn down before, oh, dear. you know. And uh, some of the other places where they had all those radio shows. Yeah. I remember visiting KFI and seeing their big studio. And uh, uh, we, w in radio at KLAC, we tried to recreate not a radio show as far as sound effects and the with dialogue we re we tried to redo the um music <coughs> portion of it like a town hall party <coughs> thing and uh, or a jamboree and uh, we had our djs on stage and between each uh, act they would do their little routines like about 10 minutes of comedy and mm -hmm. so it was uh, very interesting so to, to get back to, to my mother taking me around a couple of the stations, and then uh, I'm in uh, high school, and Dick Clark's American Bandstand moved to uh, California. And with Dick came Charlie O'Donnell uh -huh. as his, you know, his broadcaster, mm -hmm. and he was on the air at KRLA. And I said, well, I really, I really like Charlie, I, I, you know, because I'd watched American Bandstand. Mm -hmm. So I had a friend of mine whose parents, I think his father worked at ABC, and he got me tickets to American Bandstand. So I went there with the express purpose of meeting Charlie O'Donnell and telling him I wanted to get into radio and I liked KRLA and I, that's what happened. And I went to the station and visited with him and he says, 
well, I really recognize you. You've come out to some of our events, yeah. He said, well, I thought you worked here. And he said, oh, <laughs> no. He said, well, we can get you a job because you seem to know what's going on. So that's how I got my first job. Very first. Yeah. In the book paid. Okay, and you were still in high school? Um, no, I had just graduated in, in 64, and this was uh, late 64, okay. almost in the winter time. Mm -hmm. So it was really late 64 and going into January 65. Okay. And uh, before that, uh, there was a little top 40 station in San Fernando called KSFV. And uh, I tried to get on the air there and do whatever. and. You know, I did a bunch of the gopher things, you know. Mm -hmm. and they had like a little satellite studio in a record store in Granada Hills, and they broadcast from a couple other places. It was really a great way to learn radio because, you know, where are you going to go to learn radio? There sure. was really no broadcasting schools. And I found out uh, at the time San Fernando Valley State College, which later became um, California State University Northridge, it just put on a radio station, and it was like 10 watts. Mm -hmm. And they started the station when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it was the spring of uh, spring semester of 64, and so I went to Cal State, San Fernando Valley State College in the fall of 64. And uh, unfortunately, uh, my parents wanted me to take over my father's business, so I became a business admin major. But I was still taking a couple of the radio classes because that's what I wanted to yeah. do. After two years, I decided to change my major to radio and because that's what I was doing. I was working at KRLA and all these other things. I was working there in the promotion department. Ah. And uh, actually, um, one of the mm -hmm. people there at that time is uh, on the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters board, Jim Overman. Mm -hmm. He was, I think, a... Uh, couple uh, uh, classes ahead of me and he was there and, and uh, sp that spring and another just recent member Jerry Burnham was an engineer at KISS for I don't know how many years goodness mm -hmm. and he just joined uh, PBD. Good. So uh, were uh, you, uh, yes I, I was just curious uh, were you the, an only child? Or yes an, okay. yeah that's why oh not only was I an only child but I was an only child now you have to understand when I say this I'll explain it only child with three mothers. Ah. My mother, and she had two sisters who did not have children, so I was also uh, their child, too, in a way. You yeah. know? And they all, well, I spent time at their home, spent time with uh, sure. my parents. When my parents wanted to leave town and, you know, go to Balboa or mm -hmm. Palm Springs, and, you know, I had a wonderful place to stay for yeah. my that was wonderful. Two sisters, mothers, uh, my two aunts. Two aunts, sure. Yeah. Mm, how nice. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, uh, I guess when, when that happens, you uh, really get babied a lot. How did, uh, when, when Charlie O'Donnell gave you the uh, way into KLAC. KRLA. Uh, KRLA, yeah. I mean. Uh, how did you end up in, in publicity? Um, that was the job that was open because I had been to all of their um, uh, station functions, you know, when they're doing a remote uh, uh -huh. at, a, at, a, at a car dealer or remote at a supermarket or wherever. So, so I helped them hand out brochures. I helped them do all those uh -huh. things. So I got into the promotion department, helped mm -hmm. them do things. And uh, uh, one of the things I did was, it was KRLA, so they had a uh, Model A uh, the KRLA, ah. and th it was a big promotion with Bardall, mm -hmm. and we went to all the gas, I actually drove the car to all the gas stations. Mm -hmm. Imagine that, me driving a Model A on LA <laughs> freeways. <laughs> that would be fun. Um, but I, the great thing about it is we went to every gas station in, you know, basically LA and parts of Orange County, so I really learned LA, and you have to remember, this is 65, 66, this is before there were a lot of freeways, so mm -hmm. I had to learn surface streets, and it's interesting, I would keep saying to myself, you know, they should build a freeway somewhere like this, and all of a sudden, you know, there was. 10 years <laughs> later, there's the freeway. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> so I was doing promotion, I did want to get on the air, and I, uh, and I also, 
Uh, I saw the magic of uh, radio production, and I just kind of liked that. And uh, and I'd met a lot of people at different seminars and stuff. And and there was a person who I, I met who uh, worked at a radio station in Burbank, KBLA, mm -hmm. Von Hockenberger, and he was an engineer there, and there was an opening for an engineer. Mm. And so, you know, I was getting paid minimum wage at KRLA, so and all of a sudden I can be an engineer, I can be an engineer, wow. So, and I said, uh, I don't have a first class license. I said, so no, all you need is a third. Oh, great, a third, wonderful. In those days, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I uh, went to the station, did a lot of things, and my first job was playing the Sunday morning tapes and records and mm. stuff, you know. And uh, so I'd get into the station uh, about 4.30 and the DJ signs off at 5 and playing all the tapes and just still about 10 a.m. or 9 a.m., whatever it would be then. No no live person on the air? No, no, it was just, uh, you know, curtains. yeah, yeah. And so I did that. And then uh, uh, the station switched format in June mm -hmm. of 67 and I thought, uh, this is top 40. I was top 40 at KRLA, and they're switching to country music. Boy, I don't know, and I'll probably be let go. They think I'm rock and roll, and of course I'm really young, and that's what I like. So, <laughs> But uh, Bill Ward was the new program director, and uh, he offered me a job to stay on. I said, oh, great. And he says, you know, the station uh, needs some transmitter engineers, but... Uh, that we can get you a good job, but you need a first. So I went to Don Martin School of Broadcasting and got a first class license. And then, the, then he said to me, well, you realize with the first station within about a year is going to go remote. So I tell you what, go into the production room once a week. We'll schedule a time for you and just, you know, practice being a DJ and then we'll go over your tape and uh, we'll get you a nighttime uh, all night spot because you have a first class license. Hmm. He said, oh good, well that's what happened and Bill worked with me and got on the air. And so the studio was in the tra at the transmitter site? No, no, it was in Burbank. In Burbank. Yeah, actually the uh, production studio was identical to the uh, uh, on-air studio. So everything, yeah. all the buttons, everything, the turntables, everything ran identical. So, but you had to, you, you were in charge of the transmitter by remote. We, uh, yeah, when you went when they went remote. Yeah, yeah we we didn't have to have a uh, engineer at the transmitter. We could mm -hmm. what we ran the remote. But so. you needed a first phone for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was uh, a good thing there. Yeah. And where, where, where were those studios located? It's uh, 131 East Magnolia Boulevard. Now there's this gigantic shopping mall there. Oh, right? really? In San Fernando. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I've got bunches of pictures at home and about all of this stuff. All right. <laughs> but I, I worked with a lot of good people. Um, at, at KRLA, uh, Emperor Hudson was the mornings, and then Charlie O'Donnell was at 9 to noon, Casey Case from noon to 3, Dave mm -hmm. Hull 3 to 6, um, Bob Eubank, 6 to 9, and Dick Biondi, uh, 9 to midnight. Hmm. And uh, Bill Slater and, and then Johnny Hayes did all nights. Wow. It was a great staff. And at KBLA, um, Emperor Hudson, he, he thought I was following him around when I came. Yeah, he had just left, and he did mornings at KBLA. Uh, Roger Christian, Dave Diamond, Humble Harve. Hmm. And so... A lot of big names there. Yeah. So in... Um, 1971, uh, Bill Ward was the GM at uh, KBBQ, and uh, he said, uh, you know, I'm going over to be program director at KLAC, and uh, he says, why don't you come over and then be the music director there? So uh, I was the music director at KLAC from uh, uh, late 71 through 76, hmm. and uh, in 74, Metro Media owned a several stations in San Francisco, KNEW AM and uh, KSAN FM. Right. And they were going to change KNEW from Oldies Rock to country music. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was sent up there to be the uh, um, uh, temporary program director. I got things started, was there for like about, when I say there, I was in the station five days a week and at KLAC uh, two days a week. Oh, wow. Do you talk about a commute? I yeah, mean, I guess. 
Southwest Airlines wasn't even invented. It was PSA. PSA, yeah. PSA. PSA back and forth. Yeah. And uh, I was up there for a couple of months, got it started, and then uh, from KMET, Michael Hunter was named the program director at uh, KMEW, and I got to come back to LA again and be home and <laughs> not have to travel as much. It's a shame there weren't frequent flyer miles at that yeah. time. Yeah, oh boy, I guess. <laughs> You're still a single guy at this yeah. point. Yeah. So uh, I met uh, a bunch of people in the record industry by being music director, and uh, I got a job offer. And so I went into the music industry, and uh, uh, I spent like 18 years at RCA, uh, about five years with uh, Mike Kerb, uh, vice president, uh, starting a new label for him. And uh, we found this 12-year-old uh, little girl. And this is before young people were played on the radio. Uh, you know, you had to pay your dues, be like in your 30s almost, before you could even be considered it. He played your record. Mm -hmm. And I had friends calling me from everywhere, and they say, oh, Carson, you think you know everything. Signing a 12-year-old girl, you're out of your mind. What are you going to do? Just keep her on the label for 20 years before you... Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, when she was at 13, we had uh, her first album out and her first single, and at 14, she won the Grammy for uh, Best new artist, and uh, that was Leanne Rimes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, other things happened, and then Disney hired me, and uh, Hollywood Records wanted to have a uh, country label, and uh, we started Lyric Street Records, and that's the only time, other than uh, a couple days a week I was living in San Francisco, that's really the only time I actually left L.A., and for five years I lived in Nashville. Oh, you did? And uh, started Lyric Street Records. And Lyric Street? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And at Disney they have a, um, a thing about street names and the names of companies. You know, like uh, Disney's on Buena Vista Street, so it's uh, Buena Vista Music Group. And mm -hmm. Walt and Roy bought land and built their first homes on Lyric Avenue in the Los Feliz area. Mm -hmm. And we somehow didn't like the name Lyric Avenue, yeah, yeah. we liked Lyric Street, and we figured it was close enough, so yeah. <laughs> we asked we named the label, and... Uh, and Lyric has a, yeah, a song tie-in. Yeah. Totally, absolutely, yeah. Sure. Yeah, and uh, the, the biggest act that uh, mm. we found was Rascal Flatts. Mm. And uh, what would also... What year would that have been? That uh, was like 1999. 2000, okay. right in that area. I know they've been around a long time, but I didn't realize that long. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's amazing how fast time goes by. I mean, I think 2015. That's yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, what happened is I was um, on the road with a lot of uh, the musical artists, and about every maybe sixth, eighth, tenth mm -hmm. show, was a fundraiser that they'd be performing at, and we would get a tour of the school, the church, a playground, hospital, whatever was needed in the community, and, and I started seeing some things and saying, well, there needs to be a lot of help in this world. And then um, Randy Owen was the lead singer of Alabama, and that's really the first act that I, when I went to RCA, they already had a bunch of superstars. And that was really the first act that I that became a you know superstar that mm -hmm. I started from you know helped start from the beginning launching their careers, and Randy Owen mm -hmm. started uh, St. Jude's um, uh, a, a radiothon for St. Jude's Children's Hospital in Memphis, Memphis. and I'd go there once a year uh, with them and see all that was going on. They'd bring in all the radio stations to take a tour of the hospital so that all the stations knew what to say when they'd go back to their cities after viewing the children, talking to the children, and uh, it's all the doctors, and it was just a, a wonderful cause. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, an another new artist I worked with from the beginning was Martina McBride, and she had a song called Independence Day, and it, it, the whole song was um, about uh, 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 spousal abuse, domestic abuse, and, and the video and everything, and certain things were just turning inside me that said I really need to want to give back and help. And so after Disney, I really had a chance to uh, change what I did. So mm. uh, 
and it was, you know, I mentioned earlier Jim Oberman. It was Jim who introduced me to the uh, current people at Cal State Northridge, and then I got on the board at Cal State Northridge of the College of Arts, Media, and Communication mm -hmm. to uh, start helping. And I did a couple of guest speaking things, and, and, and then uh, currently I have uh, five scholarships. I have uh, three scholarships for uh, cinema, TV, arts, one scholarship for music industry studies, and one scholarship for athletics. You mean you're funding these scholarships? I'm funding, personally oh. funding, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, then I'm also uh, on the uh, President's Associates at Cal State Northridge, and also a committee member of the Heritage Society, where you know we talk about in your will to help future students by, you know, making a gift mm. in your in your will mm. to keep your legacy continuing. Your, mm -hmm. you know, you all have dreams, and your dreams can keep being, sure, you know, taken care of by leaving um, mm. whatever small amount or whatever right. amount you would like to leave. To, mm. It's a very nice uh, effort. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I, the thing that's so incredible, and, and I just, you know, look back at history, and it just seems for years and years and years, history was just the same. In these last, like, 50, 60 years, so much has changed. I mean, uh -huh. I mean, being on in radio, and I talk about things that people don't even know. What's cueing a record? What's yes. a record? A vinyl? What is a vinyl? What's a forty-five adapter? What you know? <laughs> what's hitting the network? What are you talking about? You know, and how to cue an instrumental so that it ends just as you're going into the mm. the break to go to the mutual broadcasting or CBS right. or whatever. And it's just amazing. And and then. In the record industry, you know, going from 45s to uh, cassettes, 8-tracks, I remember 4-tracks and Mad Men Mutts, you know. How about, how about 78s? That's, what, that's where I started. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I have albums at home that are 78s, mm -hmm. and it is an album, like a photo album. Instead of pages, it's the actual yep. 78, and it's just... And very heavy. Very <laughs> heavy, yes, that's true. <laughs> and, very, very, and very breakable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, now everything is like digital, and it's just uh, so amazing. It's when you were with the record companies, your primary job was repertory and artists? Or? It was uh, promotion and marketing. And marketing. Yeah, yeah. so um, I was uh, involved in... Uh, especially with Mike Hurd and with uh, Disney. I was involved uh, not in the actual signing process because that was lawyers and mm -hmm. how much the finance department would cut a deal for, et cetera. But we wouldn't sign anybody unless I felt we could market them. There was some sort of appeal. Otherwise, why do you sign people? If People say, why in the world do you sign them? What can I do? So you, you judge them on the talent that you yeah, heard. Yeah, yeah, or saw, or what saw, or mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so it was then my job to do everything from clothing to makeup to who was going to do the photo session, who was going to shoot the video, um, the sequencing of the music, uh, you know, stuff comes still in order, 1, 2, 3, 4 through 12, even if it's on a CD. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Then the sequencing of the singles, you know, because we still did singles to radio at that sure. time, and which they still do today. Did you have to go around the radio station? Oh, yes, and yeah, and we took uh, the, the artists to the stations, and uh, I had a staff, a uh, promotion staff that did that, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, you know, we'd plan on, and on all the leave-behind pieces. You know, we had to set up an, uh, everything as far as, uh, you know, the fan club, and... Uh, the logo of the artist and, you know, manufacture the uh, uh, baseball caps, t-shirts, all, all the apparel, mm -hmm. and the tour books, and just a multitude of stuff. Did you have any musical training along the way, or just listening to music? Listening, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And I just had that feel that, oh, I like that. And uh -huh. Yeah. I guess just I was lucky that I, I, what I liked, a lot of other people would like too. And I was actually almost scared that if I, I started learning music, then I would be 
become too uh, uh, critical. Like, oh, you know, they should have raised that note. They should have done this. They should. I just just wanted to judge it on what the whole overall impression was. Yeah, right. You know, of, of the music. <laughs> so. When I was the program director of the Armed Forces Radio and Television Network in the Panama Canal Zone, yeah. we AFRTS sends every week a, sure. a bunch of records on LPs. And I would always audition the top hits to, you know, be familiar with what we were going to play on the air. And this one song I remembered very distinctly, I had a bunch of guys in my office, all military people, and I put the record on, it was uh, some guy we'd never heard of before, named Billy Joel, singing, yeah. singing, singing something called Piano Man. Yeah, yeah. And I said, that's going to be a hit. <laughs> Five of the people said, you've got to be kidding. Yeah. That'll never fly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even rock and roll. What are you talking about? <laughs> I understand. But yeah. it, that certain innate feeling that you, you have that something is going to work. Yeah, and you know, I know a lot of people have that feeling, but I just felt like I was lucky enough that whatever I was thinking, and I'm mean, not right all the time. I mean, you have to understand. I was going to ask you, do you have any misses along the way? Yeah, probably more. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if the, the, the one thing is you have to know when to press the button and that means when to spend the money. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can believe in an act and you can get the, get the music out and then depending upon the feedback, you know what you need to do from that point. Because, you know, it, it, when we took Leanne Rhymes out, it was just overwhelming. And we didn't tell anybody she was 13. We just said, here's someone who's got a great voice and is going to be a star. Just listen to this. And everyone just loved it. And then when they found out she was 13, that was just the, the final thing. It just, the music was just great. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with uh, all of the, the big artists. It was uh, really the music. Uh, and I remember one day coming into a meeting, and this was the first time I ever heard this. Every meeting it was, what do they sound like? What do they sound like? Oh, what do they sound like? Boy, do they sound like so do they sound like this? This was the first meeting I heard. What do they look like? Really? That's because uh, videos and MTV were making such an impression. Uh -huh. And because of Pro Tools and a lot of other stuff, they didn't have to actually sing great. They uh -huh. could be moved, tweaked, some, tweaked <laughs> here and there to sound wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and then I think more technology came and changed an awful lot. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just feel so lucky to have worked in radio and in the music business in the best time probably ever. Okay. 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know. I, I, I mean, going to every city and, and hearing um, the radio stations and hearing the battles because there was always two big top 40 stations mm -hmm. and country music was so powerful it was a lot of after urban cowboy it seemed like every city had two country stations and just to be able to hear the the, the difference in ideas and programming from the radio uh, mm -hmm. programmers mm -hmm. and then when uh consolidation came in when every chain and every radio station was being bought up, all of a sudden now there's like three people, or yeah. there's probably 12, but, but you know, we're making the music decisions for the entire nation, where before you, you could find someone who would get your record started, mm -hmm. and then you would find the stores in that market mm -hmm. who uh, wanted to support it, and you could see if you had something. If no one came into the stores, or we sold a bunch out of the stores. It, each station had a local personality that yes. was identifiable, yeah. and that doesn't happen much anymore. Yeah, I don't even know um, where the future will be, because it, I, I knew that I could get on the air in mm -hmm. L.A. if I was willing to move to other markets mm -hmm. for three, four, five, six years, and, and get the seasoning and the training and, and the knowledge, the experience that, that was needed for a right. Los Angeles market. But promotion is promotion, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have to be that witty. I didn't have to be that clever. I just had to just get out and meet the folks and mm -hmm. tell them about the product. And 
You acted as a program director during a certain part of your career. Yeah, at KNEW. KNEW. KNEW, I'll tell you a little story about that. It originally was in Spokane, Washington, my hometown. Yes, and, and, and I know. Bought the, bought the, bought the uh, call letters. I know because they had WNEW and then they wanted KNEW and <laughs> KEWB before that. Yes. yes, exactly. I remember that up there. And, and uh, the thing I remember about the station going out to the transmitter site, they had two towers, and their nighttime <laughs> signal was a figure eight, so they could cover the Bay Area. But the transmitting towers were at the end of a pier, so that all the r copper radials were down in the salt water. Mm -hmm. But all the boats that would come by and fishermen <laughs> and whatever were picking up the copper, and oh, so the station would had to really probably redo everything about every five years, so the signal would just deteriorate totally. And then of course being on 910, that's that wonderful AM harmonic that you, uh -huh. whatever happens and <laughs> so on. But uh, mm -hmm. the station uh, uh, did real good and... Um, did you, when you were working in, the, in the Nashville, you actually had to move there, I assume. Yes, yeah. yeah. So you, did you ever have? Did you have a family at that point? Or no, no, not at all. So I was close so many times, but you know when you travel a lot, I probably did average 150. I'm sure 150 hotel nights a year. Wow. Yeah, just on the road continually, and uh, yeah. I think that was another reason why I wanted to <laughs> settle down. Yeah, you know, I hate to use the word retire because I'm just as busy now as then. I'm just you know mm -hmm. in a different direction. You know, wanting sure. to to give back and, 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 and help. And, and that's why I like the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. And what you're doing is the documenting the history because it's changed so much. I, uh, I remember at uh, KRLA, we only had two cart machines. And we had uh, 10 McKenzie players. And the McKenzie players had uh, you know, the news intro and the weather jingle and all the little beeps and whistles that, that went on and different things and news break-ins and whatever. Mm -hmm. But only having two cartridge machines, that's tough when you were doing a break. And oh, you, yeah. And, you, you know, you had to put a couple of commercials and a jingle <laughs> and this. And, you know, the, the engineer really, and then we had, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the DJ in the announce booth and we had the engineer in the engineering side. And... So many things changed. Uh, like I told you, I drove the KRLA. I would, uh, I'm out there hearing all of the, the, the people coming up to me saying, why don't you tell the station, why don't you tell the station? And the biggest thing I was getting is, why don't you play more oldies? And uh, whatever happened to all those big hits, we don't hear them. It takes like a couple of years, and then we, you start to, why, why do you do that? And I, I want to go back to... Uh, uh, the PD and the music director said, here's what I'm hearing. And I said, I suggest we play four oldies an hour. We were playing one or two. Mm. And I said, we should play four oldies an hour, one per quarter hour. And I remember the program director saying, wow, that's kind of radical. <laughs> <laughs> really radical. <laughs> so, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, why in the world, where do these songs go? These are big hits. They're just, you know, I mean, uh, you know, and, and at the time everybody was talking about the Rolling Stones uh, and Satisfaction. How come we don't hear this anymore? It's just why. Yeah. And I, and I said, well, why, how come? They said, well, it's it's an incubation. It's waiting to become an oldie. And mm -hmm. I said, why? Yeah. Well, that's just the way it's been done. That's what we do. And then, of course, when KHJ came on the air and they started to play those records in the different rotation mm -hmm. after they got off. And, and that's why I think the Drake format was so successful. And he played the oldies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and then more music and the simplicity of sound that uh, mm -hmm. Drake did. And then other programmers came in after him doing the same thing. Uh, you know, there, there were a lot of great stations, like I said, uh, in programming at that time. But that set the top 40 side, and a lot of that went into other formats. Mm -hmm. As I know in country music, we were seeing what was working at Top 40, and we were trying to take what would work in country music right. uh, as far as the air uh, delivery sound, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and now I, I look at the charts, and I can't tell the difference between charts. 
You used to know if it was top 40, they played the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and the Beach Boys. If it was KMPC and MOR, it was Sinatra and <laughs> Dean Martin and uh, no. Today, it's the same song on all the stations at d different times. Yeah. It's like, I... I, I yeah. <laughs> Frequently, I, I, I listen to a country artist, and I turn to my wife and say, that doesn't sound country to me. I, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very nice song, but it's yeah. not country. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, I heard that same thing when mm -hmm. I was uh, uh, programming. Uh, we, we would have people saying, why are you playing John Denver? Why are you playing the Eagles? Well, they're not country. Well, now there's more country than country radio That's is. Right. That's right. <laughs> Thank God I'm a country boy. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you ever think that, that growing up in high school, for instance, that you would ever go to country music no, as, no, a, no. as a career? No, but because of Top 40 Radio, I didn't realize that I had a background in country music. And also because this is Los Angeles, it was like an extension of Texas. Mm. And I remember on TV... Uh, some of the big shows, Spade Cooley. I'd watch Spade Cooley show all the time. Then right after that came uh, the Jackie Gleason show. And I'd watch these all the time. And, and there was always a lot of country music. On Saturdays, it seems like there was a lot of country music shows. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that I just, I was under the impression of two types of music, good music and bad music. I didn't know it was... You know, yeah. I'm listening to classical music. I just thought that was more good music. I'm sure. listening to whatever salsa. I'm listening mm -hmm. to, you know, jazz. I just thought it was just all good music. Then KFWB played the top 40 most popular tunes. So jazz, there's Dave Brubeck. And, you know, mm -hmm. so from each thing you, you have something. And then WB played uh, Dean Martin. And they <laughs> played Sinatra. And also at the same time, they played Little Richard. So mm -hmm. yeah. That's why the station, I think, was so successful. Okay. But today, I don't see that uh, clear-cut definition as uh, at that time. Do you still listen to uh, various radio stations? Or I don't have to listen to one. I seem to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like, uh, I, I, I do. I uh, listen to the country, listen to uh, mm. uh, K-Earth. I love the, uh, the oldies. And I like... Actually, on high definition, I listen to the uh, K-Earth 2, because they play the old oldies, the doo-wop oldies. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, Kiss and yeah. all these other stations. Uh, then I like Satellite, too, because there's a lot of stuff on Satellite. That I just heard on the news coming in today that uh, Apple is announcing a new music series. Yeah, yeah. So, what, if it's 10 bucks a month, you can stream your music down to your whatever device you're listening to it on? Yeah. See, there's something about the possession of a piece of product. I possess in my hand an album, and there's the artwork on the album, and there's just, it's, you see it's the big pictures of the, right. the artist, and inside there might be something. And uh, I, I also remember going to Wallach's Music City. And you, they had listening rooms, mm -hmm. and you could go into the listening room. They were, you know, right there on Sunset Boulevard. You'd, you'd look right out at Sunset Boulevard, and you're in there listening to a 45 that you might want to buy. Exactly. Or uh, it was a cheap date. You'd go in there and listen to some music, and then yeah. <laughs> go somewhere and get a coke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I used to do that all the time. Listen to albums before I bought them or yeah. singles. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, <clears throat> Well, you've had quite a varied career, I would say, and one that has taken you in a different direction than you probably planned in the beginning. Yeah, well, what I planned in the beginning was taking over my father's store. Exactly, I was going to ask that. Who, who did? Yeah, and, and so I, uh, you know, being a business, here's what happened is, it was, wasn't for maybe about 30 years after I had graduated, I realized that I had a secret weapon. And that secret weapon was the knowledge I had gained from college, and especially from business administration. Mm -hmm. Just because you're in a record company, just it's a business. Mm 
Yeah. So I had learned business law, I had learned uh, accounting and marketing and, you know, other stuff. And it was just like, it helped me climb the corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. And that was one reason why I really wanted to go back to Cal State Northridge and, and help them out. And once again, Jim Overman was uh, great, to, great to introduce me to everybody out there. and. Uh, was business your, your major in, at Cal State? Northridge? It was uh, freshman and sophomore, and then I switched it to uh, uh, radio TV arts. Okay. For junior, senior. Mm -hmm. And because uh, by then, it, you know, what I found out is, you know, oh, yeah, I, I failed to mention another thing. Is I, I grew up um, going to uh, first through fourth grade, Our Lady of the Holy Rosary. And then my parents decided to send me to military school. Mm. I went to Ridgewood Military Academy in uh, Woodland Hills. Really? And uh, this was a school that uh, I didn't, just, there were just other kids in the class, but, well, you know, Scott Holden, William Holden's son, um, uh, mm. younger were uh, uh, two of uh, Roy Rogers' children. Uh, 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 William Whitney, the director, his son was in my class, and, mm -hmm. and he was right here in this, this place here. He did all the Republic movies. He did Zorro and Zorro serials. He did a lot of serials, and he did a lot of his shooting up in Lone Pine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, it's interesting how I, even in school, I got to meet and continually was just bombarded with the entertainment industry. How could you not be if you lived in L.A.? That's right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And uh, another uh, student, uh, George uh, uh, Winslow, he'd appeared as a uh, child actor. Uh, at the time, he'd done a couple of movies, one with Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. and uh, he had the foghorn voice for a for little kid. He had a uh, foghorn voice. Hey, how are you doing? And it was <laughs> so funny. Yeah. And um, anyway, uh, actually, I went to high school with him. And in high school, uh, Jerry Mathers was... Uh, uh, when I was a senior, he was a sophomore, and mm -hmm. just just everywhere I went, you ran into it. Yeah. So. So how was the military academy? Did you enjoy that? Absolutely. Yeah, because. Uh, that was after high school. No, no, that was uh, middle school. Middle school. Yeah. Okay. That was uh, uh, six, seven. That was five, six, seven, and eight, mm -hmm. and then I went to Notre Dame High School. Okay. Here in Sherman Oaks at 9, 10, 11, 12, mm -hmm. and graduated from Notre Dame and then went to Cal State Northridge. Gotcha. 64 through 68. Oh, goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you weren't in the military uh, service of it. No, no. You missed the draft, I guess. Just yeah. luckily. Yeah. Uh, it was just coming down to it, and then um, I was at the very end of the lottery, and then by just didn't need anybody anymore. Yeah, yeah. you lucked out. Yeah. Very good. So yeah, I had a, had a, had a wonderful time. And like I said, I just saw so much stuff. But the military school, I mean, you know, we, uh, I mean, who else gets to shoot rifles? <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and drive tanks. Mm -hmm. well, I actually didn't drive the tank, but I'm in the tank while it's being driven. And, uh, mm -hmm. and one memorable um, weekend, we were at uh, Fort MacArthur in San Pedro, and, uh, you know, we were, uh, you know, it's the Cold War and us versus Russia, and they'd sent up Sputnik, and then I think the Navy would, had sent up a satellite, and it didn't even get off the ground, it all exploded. And this weekend was when uh, we were doing, uh, the, the U.S. Army was doing uh, mm -hmm. their satellite, and it went up and circled, and we watched that there at uh, Fort MacArthur, and... Uh, Everybody was applauding the whole base. It's the army. It's the army. <laughs> so, oh, man. yeah. So in a way, I was kind of disappointed, but uh, yeah, yeah. But then I knew so many friends of mine who had gone, and you know, and the stories and all the stuff. I, in a way, I guess I'm happy I didn't. But. Well, it, it can be one or the other. I mean, yeah. I liked out and got sent to Germany and spent two wonderful years there, but. I could have gone to Korea just as well. Yeah, like you mentioned AFRTS, I had uh, two friends of mine that their job was vacation relief of AFRTS. Uh -huh. They went two weeks, <clears throat> in like almost every week was, every two weeks there were somewhere, 
That's all they did for two years. Just every two weeks, they were in some place uh, doing radio relief. Yeah, that's <laughs> terrific. Wonderful. What a job. I said, well, I could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever run into, I was thinking of some of our talent that we hired, uh, Gene Price? Was oh, our worked with Gene guy. Price. He's wonderful. He yeah. a terrific guy. Yeah, yeah. Jim Pewter? Jim. Uh, worked with Jim. Uh, there's some other little places I worked at. One of them was uh, Custom Fidelity Records, mm -hmm. and I was still at uh, KBBQ at the time. And uh, I had a friend of mine who was making for Top 40 stations a uh, Oldies But Goodies album where the station would have their call letters and the pictures of the disc jockeys and have, you have the cover and the back cover wherever they wanted to do it as a promotion. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, <clears throat> no one's done this for a country. So they hired me to come in to help do some of the country stuff. So, ah. excuse me, I got a bunch of country stations to do the, the album and stuff. And mm -hmm. about that time, we went to KLIC, and uh, Bill said, well, that's really nice, but we need you here now full time. It's OK, I understand. So then I had to let that go. Sure. Um, another job I had uh, was uh, KNXT, uh, working for the big news. Oh, you I did? was a film runner. Oh. And uh, you tell about the people today, they don't understand. Well, there was no yeah. satellite, there was no mm -hmm. video cameras, everything was shot on film. Okay. So the uh, talent and the engineer, the, 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 not the engineer, but the film uh, camera person, mm -hmm. I would drive in a station wagon and I would follow them in another car because they would go to the event, they would sh the, 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 the cameraman would shoot the film of the announcer and then they'd give me the case to take back to channel 2 on sunset mm -hmm. and then uh, they would develop the film and whatever and there's another thing that, that I told people today they don't even believe that you could do this I had a KNXT car the only way you could get on the network is from New York uh -huh. there were no satellites and no phone lines it just it was the network from New York because mm -hmm. all of everything came this way that's right so something we decided was going to be on the network Someone had to take the developed film. Go to an airplane. To, yes, so I had clearance to drive on the tarmac at LAX, mm -hmm. and I actually drove up to the United Airlines or American Airlines right underneath the plane. I would climb out of the car, walk up the steps, and I would hand over the packet to the flight attendant, and I would get the, the you know, the bill that they'd taken it, and, mm -hmm. and then we could tell New York when to be at... Uh, Kennedy or LaGuardia and pick it up. Pick it up. The film runner would pick it up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I remember some of the some of the big stories that I worked on. Um, the one was Don Drysdale, 53 shutout innings. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to go to like three Dodger games because that's, you didn't know when the streak was going to end. Yeah. So I'm there at the game. And my whole job, the, the cameraman is just filming and filming and filming because <laughs> you never knew when the hit was going to come or yeah. the score of the run. Yeah. And I got to sit there and eat hot dogs and yeah. watch the game. But So finally on the third uh, time that we went, you know, they got the run. I had to take the film back. And then, since it was at night, we still had to get it to New York. So, you know, I, I took it down to LAX. And was this before, before you got into the... Uh, all this was at the same time. <laughs> all the same. I was, like I said, my career could have gone I don't know how many different yeah. directions. But I was... But you were out of school at this point. Oh, uh, this was summer. Summer. Summer, okay. yeah. So I... Uh, I think I was out of school. I think this was summer 68. I was at KNX team. Okay. And, um, yeah, and I, w I was doing that. And then uh, another one was uh, uh, sad. Uh, it was uh, uh, the assassination of uh, Robert Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just some sad visuals that I still have. And, sure. uh yeah. Him and the family and all that in the hospital and mm. so and uh, just other stories where we would be you know it seemed like every other day at city hall and bringing back whatever and, but uh, on uh, I think the most trips I made to the airport was during the uh, uh, Kennedy uh, because the only way you got the film on the network was getting it uh, on a plane to New York. Right. 
and no one realizes uh, how simple communication is today, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, in an instant you can be on YouTube, in an instant you can mm -hmm. post anything, and everybody sees it around the world. And actually the first time that happened, it was um, probably 1999 or 98. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an artist, Laurie White, and uh, we sent her on a USO tour, and she was doing, um, I think it was the time of the Bosnia, Herzegovina, mm -hmm. what, 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 I can't remember if that was 99, 98, 2000, somewhere in there. And um, the photos that they took, you know, they, they took on that old Sony digital camera where you actually had a floppy disk that you put in and it only hold like seven pictures that we took good quality. Mm -hmm. And they had a laptop and they could just get in somehow on an internet at the, the, at the base. And we had pictures within one hour of what the performance and whatever that we could send out to all the radio stations, look what's going on now, you know, and <laughs> yeah. that's amazing. And then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, the fastest I ever got a record out, which I'm sure today it's probably even faster, was 9-11. Uh, and we had an artist, uh, Aaron Tippin, and he came in um, on Thursday and said, so I've written a song, and gave us the song, and he said, oh man, we really like it. And he says, okay, I can book studio time, and I can have the, the finish mastered to you on Monday. So here's, you know, like about a week later, mm -hmm. from 9-11, and there was a, a company that had just been started, and they were uh, using downloads of uh, commercials, for radio stations, and instead of sending all the commercials to all the stations, you know, these would be the big dubbing thing. And mm -hmm. So we used them to download the song on Monday, and everybody had the song with, within like about three, four hours of mm -hmm. the song being delivered. I said, this is just amazing. <laughs> it really is. Right. And it's all, you know, totally different from everything's yeah. downloaded, everything is everything. It's just, but, uh, mm, yeah. Yeah. One final question for you. What happened to your father's company? Oh, he uh, sold it, parts of it. He just uh, retired and uh, okay. yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, and I think um, they they didn't understand what it was I was doing, especially in the music business, because mm -hmm. it kept you're on a plane again. Who pays for all this? Because you know, <laughs> well, it's the how do they have all this money to pay for? Well, I, and when I bought my first house, and my parents come over, and I just remember them looking around and going like, "This is yours." Said, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I bought it. Then when I bought my second house, it was double the size. I don't even know why I bought this house. It, was just, yeah. it just felt good. Yeah. <laughs> and so they came out and they're like, we're moving in. Because <laughs> 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 you've got the swimming pool and the jacuzzi. We want to move in. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and so when I'm out of town a lot, why don't you just get a room and then in here, and then uh, when I'm out of town, just come over and water the lawn while you're... Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, oh, yeah. Dear. yeah. Well, it's quite a... A very interesting story, Carson. I think that people listening to this in uh, 2120 <laughs> will be amazed at some of the things you've talked about. Uh, we've been speaking with Carson Schreiber, a member of the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters Board of Directors, and uh, we've been recording this interview on June 8, 2015, at the CBS Studio Center in Studio Center, California. My name is Jerry Fry. I'm the audio, audio historian for Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters, and thanking you very much for listening.